the worst, most tired cliche in introducing someone is to say they need no introduction. <laughs> and um, I would slightly modify it. I, I hope Nassim needs no introduction because it's impossible to introduce him. Uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb is unclassifiable. <laughs> uh, this combination has never been seen before. <laughs> uh, Nassim, uh, who actually, to give my own personal story of the virtues of New York City, one of the pleasures of moving to New York City in 2003 was that soon after I got to meet with the author of Fooled by Randomness, Nicholas N Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And he's since written two other uh, very well-known books and other books that are not as much for a mass market, but the two He's written The Black Swan, and most recently, Anti-Fragile. He's run his own de derivatives firm. He was a pit trader at one point. He's written 35 academic papers, uh, possibly competing in the Olympics and gymnastics, for all that I know. Um, <laughs> um, so it's really a pleasure to have him to close our conference. And please give Nassim Nicholas Talat a warm welcome. Thanks. Uh, I'm extremely honored to be here, and it was a great presentation on uh, the, the, the power of bottom-up systems and some of, of the properties. Uh, please, no flash. I, I may lose consciousness, and then you may have to use another speaker. <laughs> so I'm gonna, what I'm going to talk about is something very precise, but I'm going to try to link it to research on uh, cities, okay, because there is a connection uh, via nonlinearities. So over the past next, uh, I guess, uh, 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about fragility. And then we're going to see how uh, size at some point makes you fragile, at some point, where's that point, how, why a collection of distributed city-states are more <laughs> robust than a nation-state, why, for example, elephants are not as uh, robust as mice, and, and, but these are physical properties. And then we're going to see how bottom-up system <coughs> makes a lot of small errors, and you want to make multiply errors. And actually, you probe through complex system via errors. So it's so very precise, focused on this, with a link to uh, a non-romantic uh, version of small is beautiful. Th there is a romantic version of small is beautiful, and then they give you explanation. And it, it sounds good, but it's not science. Um, I'm going to, and this is actually not empirical science so much as necessary mathematical truth with properties of object. What, what convexity and nonlinear response necessarily implies as far as size is concerned. Anyway, so let's start with this coffee cup here. Uh, this coffee cup has one property, fragility. Okay, we know it's fragile. Nobody had defined fragility. Okay, before uh, there's some versions, but nothing uh, really. Uh, uh, I would say not fragile. There's no non-fragile definition of, uh, of fragility other than one that, uh, that it took a while, about 20 years, to figure out, which is fragile is what doesn't like disorder. Simple, OK? In other words, if there's a random event hitting an earthquake in New York, um, I think, yeah, earthquakes are not, cities are not good with earthquakes. This one disadvantage. Well, this coffee cup doesn't have any upside. So it, it's, it, uh, events are either neutral or negative for, for these things. And we can define fragility based on that. And then we're going to see what doesn't like fragility, why it doesn't like a lot of other things like time and, and, and so on. Can you hear me well with this? OK, thanks. Now, sometimes people, because I know economists don't like me, sometimes I turn it off completely. <laughs> so I, I talk, and, and but so you, you never know. All right. OK, so one thing, there have been some research on cities particularly by the people at Santa Fe, people who deal with complex systems, please, I beg you, no, 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 no flash, all right? Uh, this is a negative externality the professor was discussing before. So there's something, this is what I, I found on the web as far as allometry, is that effectively when things grow, something economists have yet to discover, things don't grow in the same way. So when you have a, the, the relative uh, size of the head of a child as compared to that of an adult. The second thing I want you to notice is this curve. As you see, there's a curve there, the curve of um, the, the relationship between metabolic rate and uh, uh, size, okay, uh, expressed, say, in mass, okay. And, that, and as you see, just the only thing you have to return from this is that it's nonlinear. That's the only thing you need to notice from it. 
uh, that it's not a straight line, if you, unless you do a log-log plot, in which case some people claim it's a straight line, actually, they try to fit straight line. But you can see here easily that it is nonlinear, okay? It's not, the raw relationships are not straight. And then the other thing we could do is, effectively, we can figure out the shape of animals based on very small number of, of uh, pieces, simply because they scale, they have to scale the, in a certain way. So if you have a small pieces, you can really build, figure out how this animal looks like, okay? And, and within, you know, you can get, get it right within, you know, small errors. Anyway, so let me restart talking about fragility. So a lot of people at Santa Fe have done work on cities based on what we call uh, allometry. Um, West and, and uh, Betancourt and, and, uh, and these people, uh, admirable work. So just to tell you that there have been a lot of work one can use to fit these ideas, but I'm going to talk about just my work, right? What I do is what I bring to the picture is that notion of fragility that I picked up as an option trader in what does and doesn't like volatility. So, and then also there's a property that's the opposite of fragile. When you ask people what's the opposite of fragile, they say robust. Robust isn't quite the opposite of fragile. Because if you ask people, even here at NYU, even in the eco economics department, what's the opposite of negative, they don't say uh, neutral. Or the opposite of negative is positive. So negative fragility is not, uh, you know, uh, nothing. So the opposite would be something that gains from disorder, okay? This is effectively the shape of something fragile okay, in time series space. It has no upside from random events, pretty much like a bank portfolio if you short volatility. And this is what is not fragile, robust. You know, it doesn't care. And this is the opposite, where the errors are small and gains cannot be large. In other words, gain, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, harm cannot be large, the opposite of the other one. And this we taxonomize as anti-fragile. And effectively, this is the only thing that have words on it that I put in here. There's a major property, which is anything that likes one of these will like the others. If you like uncertainty as a property, then you necessarily will like uh, time. Okay, if you don't like uncertainty, take we humans don't like uncertainty. We have no upside from uncertainty, which is that which is the reason why if we extend life forever, say uh, medication, whatever it is, uh, yoga, or anything, extend life, you still would not live forever simply because a small probability of an accident, random events cannot help you as much as they harm you, and that's sufficient to make you you know leave the gene pool eventually from an accident. Okay, accident free is not possible. So what doesn't like uncertainty doesn't like variability. What likes uncertainty likes variability. And then we can you know, see that in a second order effect. So this is pretty much what my work is. Now one intuition in a book, Anti-Fragile, and, and, and that would help us get an idea of if something likes disorder or doesn't like disorder, or, okay, or likes a moderate amount of disorder or not, is this chapter I put in Anti-Fragile, given that I hate the press because they try Unlike uh, pro Professor Easterly, they don't have the, they want to categorize you, categorize what you write about, put it this, is this, this, is this, that, you know, things you don't really care about. So uh, they, they completely destroyed my black swan idea by, by conveying the wrong message. Black swan is about robustness to classes of events that we cannot compute. It's not about animals, you know, and sexy images and trying to predict random events of large consequences. So to, to retaliate, I wrote that chapter, I made sure that no chapter in Anti-Fragile can, no chapter title can give you any indication about this contents, <laughs> right? Unless you've read it and then I say, okay, oh yeah, yeah, that's true. So just to punish the journalists, and effectively they couldn't read the book because usually they read the table of content and they stop there and then make a theory of where you're wrong about and stuff like that, okay, this is typical. So I just wrote something on, on precautionary principle against GMOs, and I noticed that people start commenting automatically, scientists, without reading what's inside there because their comments were already addressed as a fallacy in the text, it means they didn't read it. So it's typical of, of uh, a lot of, most people uh, uh, who comment, the more people comment, the less they read what they commented on. And it's pretty much an inverse law, anyway. So the main idea is on a main difference between a cat and a washing machine. <coughs> okay, and, and so 
But it, so, but that's a central idea. What's the main difference between the organic and non-organic, between the engineered and non-engineered? This is a watch, okay? And this watch will never benefit from a random event. Do you agree? Okay, you, if you bang on it, it's not gonna get better. My, my, my uh, bones get better if I bang on a table, all right? May break the table, you know, if you do too, too much, you need a stronger table, okay, <laughs> over time. So there's a difference between the organic and the engineered. The organic communicates with its environment via stressors and only via stressors, <laughs> okay? Y your skin doesn't communicate with the environment via your brain. If you go in a sun, it, 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 it will overshoot, thinking that there's going to be more sun tomorrow, and it will, uh, will uh, darken. You agree? Same with bone density, same with stuff like that. Shocks improve. This is why people go to the gym. We don't quite get that idea that some things we classify as engineered because we read too many books about them, okay, effectively are uh, organic. And I call that the Soviet Harvard fallacy, or top-down design thinking, something that's organic. And I'm sure it applies to the previous speakers you know, intuitions. And that fallacy is, is very big. Take uh, the economy, all right? Is the economy something to be engineered or something organic that has a bottom-up uh, process and only probe because uncertainty cannot be probed by top-down systems if there's a, a certain class? And effectively, forest fires, if you repress forest fires, forest is something organic, complex systems. If you repress forest fires, the risks accumulate, and the minute you have a big fire, it collapses, all right? So same thing with the economy, but Mr. Greenspan, I think he got his PhD here, NYU. I mean, it's not, the university is not harmless things, all right? So he wanted no more boom and bust. He didn't understand that because you, your washing machine doesn't need, okay, variation, variability in the environment to get better, okay? The economy needs it to clean up the, the, the junk, the bad stuff, the bad companies, so people can fail early. And that's the property of a good complex system and a property of a good organic bottom-up system. It should fail early <laughs> and frequently to clean up continuously. And that's how you probe uncertainty. Via, you don't probe it via planning. You probe it via experimentation. So convex experimentation, as we'll see. So the, the, this brings also a mistake in, in, in the perception of complex system or stuff like that, is that people mistake variability for risk, mostly because we have uh, bad terminology. It's just we're victims of a terminology, <laughs> you see? Risk is not variability, all right? Except, uh, I think it started in e econ departments and in decision science, and then people said, oh, well, let's control risk, therefore you control variability. You're not, the, the only two are together in some class, for some narrowly defined class of distribution, you control very, uh, variance of the Gaussian distribution, you lower tail risk automatically. They're two different animals. And effectively, if you eliminate variability from system, they blow up. And this we've known in control theory since Maxwell, <laughs> right? So people, a lot of people know about these things, but it so happened that those involved in economic stuff have a simplified view of things, okay? So if you remove, and, and when I was writing The Black Swan, I quizzed people, uh, I would tell them there are two countries, two types of countries. One country uh, had 40 governments. The other country had only two governments over the same period. Which one is more stable? Actually, there are two countries on the right and one on the left. The one on the left was what? Which one is more stable? Most people said that the one that only had two governments was more stable. Which one of the country that had 40 governments? Well, it's not hard to guess. Italy, all right? It's still around last time. I'm going, actually, right now I have my suitcase. I'm going there. So I hope it's there, all right? Still standing, all right? <laughs> the, 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 what is, which country was on the right, the country that had few governments, hence was perceived by, unanimously by the people I asked, mostly economists, uh, unanimously as more stable, Syria, all right? So this is the problem, all right, over-intervention. If you order in the system, you make it seem a lot more stable, but eventually it collapses. <laughs> And now I have an article coming out in Foreign Affairs, triggered by Professor Easterly, actually, who asked me to talk about city-states. And I, I can't talk about that. When I was a trader, I could argue with a lamppost about anything, all right? But now that I'm a, 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 a scientist, I can only argue about things and very well-defined stuff. So I, I, I wrote a paper in Foreign Affairs to tell them what's, uh, you know, the early, the, the way you can figure out if something's gonna blow up. And one of them is overstability. 
accessibility, low variability, and stuff like that. So low dimensionality. Now, now the big mistake also is in, in, in real life, we, are, uh, we have effectively too many psychologists on the planet. <laughs> because uh, when you ask people, you know, you tell, uh, uh, hey, have you heard of uh, post-traumatic uh, disorder? Everybody knows about it. We cure people, stuff, you know? But uh, you ask him, hey, have you heard of something called post-traumatic growth? How many of you have heard of post-traumatic growth? And for those, how many times have you heard of it? <laughs> right? Are you a psychologist? No, I read your book. Oh, OK, all right. <laughs> so OK, she read my book. So post-traumatic growth, that things from the Romans, people knew that things overcompensate by jumping higher right, from compensation. So post-traumatic growth, I think, uh, uh, I think um, uh, the research is about 100 to 1 mentioned in psychology literature, and I think the prevalence is about uh, 1 to 100, right? Post-traumatic growth, you're 100 times more likely to bounce back from a small trauma than be harmed by it. But then again, why do, this, it's part of that what I call Soviet Harvard mentality that started with the modernity, but also there's another element. Nobody's ever going to make any money trying to cure you of post-traumatic growth. Right, which is exactly where you have an agency problem. So, city states. One thing about city states, effectively, there's a mechanism of overcompensation. Okay, uh, but this is not my research, so I'll say it here casually. Don't tell anyone I said it. But uh, if you look, uh, you notice that what how countries get rich, the Phoenician way. Supposedly my ancestors, but I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, with uh, visitors to the area, but the the Phoenicians had no resources. So they went to Cyprus, named after copper, all right, uh, to import uh, copper, all right? And they say, hey, he, we're importing. It's an easy thing. Now we have a boat. What do you do with it, OK? So it looks like it's a case of most small units that have absolutely no resources. So we start trading, and trading becomes a business. So overcompensation again. Uh, it's, it may work for Venice. Venice has another thing that may, you know, that's of interest. That, that, it's my specialty, which is what I call the Lindy effect. But uh, it could be that that was also the case of Venice. Uh, I wasn't there. It definitely is a case of Singapore. Okay, so if you need something, if you have a little bit of post-traumatic growth, makes you, <laughs> you know, overcompensate by be being rich. But also, there's a matter of scale. Scale is a problem. Uh, I, in my foreign affair article. I uh, vented frustration because I went to a conference with people doing political science and say, how on earth can you compare you know, political system without attaching a size to it? Okay? Singapore is different, okay, from, has a different governance from China, all right? but they both have similar political systems. Okay? Uh, Singapore is not even Dubai, all right? is closer to Singapore, but it has a, you know, it's not a Saudi Arabia. It's not Saudi Arabia, it's smaller Saudi Arabia. Things don't scale. There is something that governance doesn't scale. A lot of things don't scale. Things, when they're distributed, they, they scale differently, OK? So now let me talk about nonlinearity. And then we'll get to the point of that's my specialty. All right, my specialty is any curve that has this in it, OK, as an option trader, automatically we associate with it with money, p and we're going to lose, make. So automatically, a different part of my brain gets engaged, and then I can talk about it with some confidence and produce theorems. But the rest is, again, anecdotal, all right? The cities is, uh, before it was anecdotal. This is not anecdotal. There's something about uh, uh, fragility, all right, that really uh, uh, makes it very easy to detect. It's as follows. If I harm someone with this big stone, in, in my book, I, I, I discussed something in, uh, from Midrash Tehillim where a king had to punish his son. And the punishment was this big stone on his head. Right? But the king was not very excited about uh, the, the, the regulation and couldn't change the regulation. Right? So uh, it was not the Bush family or something like that. So he had to go with it. But, and then the rabbi came with a great, a great idea. And the idea was to break that in small pebbles and you can execute the punishment and, and, and keep the sun, OK? And so what is so from that, we can figure out that the ancients weren't that stupid. They understood very well the, that if I, harm, if I throw a 20-pound uh, block of concrete on your head, or, and I'm not threatening, again, I mean, this is uh, a, a thought experiment, OK? And you have to say that now. People may sue you and stuff. <laughs> the, it's assume as a thought experiment that, that 
I saw someone's head, okay? Someone from ISIS, say, okay, so for me. <laughs> 20 pound concrete, do I harm him more than twice that if I hit him with a 10 pound block of concrete? Yes, no. Is it more than twice? All right, if it's yes, then, he's, then, then we have a, a very easy uh, uh, universality to fragility. That's pretty much a, something that actually by theorem you can pull out. What doesn't like, like uncertainty has to have that. And the interesting thing is anything, everything alive has to have this, uh, this reaction. So the way we define fragility was a little complicated, is a sensitivity uh, to uncertainty as expressed by some measure of uncertainty that we found is quite universal, all right? And incidentally, I don't know, I mean, let me move the graph from here so people don't faint. But uh, uh, in incidentally, pe people here do economics or do statistics, econometrics or statistics, stuff like that, okay. Can you ever see sigma without time? Okay, sigma is always has time attached to it, all right? So you can see time without sigma for interest rates and discounting, all right? So time and, uh, uh, and sigma and scale of distribution are the same thing in physics and in economics, except for a few exceptions. And, and these exceptions are usually uh, approximations, by the way. So, and, so it tells us the following, that we can define fragility and a lot of things and, and shocks based on some dislike of some measure of uncertainty. If an, uh, there's an option trade in the room, you would say Vega, okay, negative Vega. That's what its name is. And it's not a Greek uh, word, but I, I don't know how it came about, the word Vega, uh, but uh, it's something, how something doesn't like change in volatility and, and, and or some kind of uh, degree of uncertainty in a system. So based on that measure, I'll remove this very quickly, we can do things to continue the, 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 the thing, the, our process. And, and let's look at a, a simple story, which is illustrative. Have you heard of Carviel, the French rogue trader? Okay, so you heard that he was hiding $50 billion, uh, 50 billion uh, euros in a drawer, okay? And that would show you why distributed systems usually fare better. Um, they discovered the error, okay? It was a uh, uh, Martin Luther King holiday in New York, but the French didn't know about it, right? So they thought the markets were, okay? And they tried to dump in the market 50 uh, billion euros. And it was a French uh, uh, government type uh, bank methods, which means one trader on the phone selling and 10 people telling him what to do. <laughs> That's the reverse, Re really. So at the end of the day, the liquidation cost is what cost them, you know, is, is, is what harmed them. And it was 4 billion euros of losses. Markets ended up down 12%. When you're dumping $50 billion, you lose 12%, all right? The market ended up, uh, so they lost an average 8%. That's uh, the average of what they lost. So this, no, now let's think about it. What if instead of having a large bank, Société Générale, the employer of Kerviel, you had 10 smaller banks, and each one of them would have, in turn, a Kerviel problem, okay, independently. That can be the same day even, it doesn't matter. With a different random variable, different things. Or, you know, there are a lot of things you could trade or you could cheat with. Kerviel cheated with, uh, with some S&P futures, the other person can cheat with coconut uh, oil futures, whatever it is, so you have 10 of them. And you're trying to liquidate now 5 billion euros. And even if you did it the Soviet way, the Soviet way is 50 people telling one person what to do, all right? <laughs> okay, so we have really hierarchy. So, and then you have on top of them 500 people telling what to do. So assume you did it the Soviet way, how much would it cost you to liquidate 5 billion? Nothing, Not, uh, close to nothing. Today, close to nothing. So we have a curve here, a very simple curve. You see that accelerated uh, curve? It's nonlinear, all right? L the, the linear is the red one, and the nonlinear is the vertical one. The, the, the vertical one, the nonlinear is the blue one. For large deviation, the nonlinear is harmed much more than the linear one. You see? But for small deviation, it doesn't show any harm. And uh, on a vertical axis, you have harm. On a horizontal axis, you have event size. Think of stone, how much a stone would harm you, okay? 
versus uh, weight of the stone. So we have what we call convexity effect. And that is pretty much a law of everything that has survived. And it's necessary. Because think about it. If you jump 10 meters, you die. No? OK, except at NYU, but then the other special case. Sorry. But the people die if you jump 10 meters. But then if you jump 100,000 times one millimeter, you don't die. There's, it's not linear. OK? Why? Because you have many, ma many small shocks compared to large shocks. So anything that survived is necessarily sensitive to large deviations. It would have, the multiplicity of small deviation would have uh, uh, killed the thing early. To give you an idea of the, uh, an example of the coffee cup, there are uh, 4 million earthquakes per annum. It depends what you call an earthquake, between 2 and 4 million, all right? I forgot what, what the threshold. The coffee cup feels all of them, but it doesn't care. But you go above 3 on Richter scale, it's gone, you see? So you have nonlinearity. So uh, it means larger deviations, because they're rare, okay, haven't been experienced by the item. So items sensitive to the large deviations have, you know, survived. So this, I mean, uh, the graph before can explain to us a lot of things. You know, why when you grow, there's something called diseconomies, stochastic diseconomies of scale. You, are, you have economies of scale, we all know about it. Anybody who studied anything in business school has heard the word economies of scale. But then there's a logical fallacy right there they can observe. The first thing I realized when, if you think dynamically, is when the professor is talking about the uh, economies of scale, say, why on Earth don't we have like two companies on planet Earth? And effectively, so if you don't have to be blind. And at a time when I was in school, there was a, uh, I'm very old, all right? So the, uh, the, the, there was a theory about the, that mergers didn't work. Companies doubled in size, and, but they didn't deliver the predicted thing, the predicted benefits, okay? And it was then called the hubris hypothesis. So, so people still talked about the economies of scale, and then they explained, it, yeah, because they got arrogant. Type, okay, so it, people get arrogant, stuff like that. All these romantic explanations don't work. The only one is an elephant breaks a leg if it falls from this. Right, or falls from he from this height, an elephant breaks a leg. A mouse, as they say across, or uh, I, I teach in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, they say it don't care. All right, <laughs> so really, so so you realize that the scale. So you have something called diseconomies, of and this we can measure. We can measure. Uh, you take uh, uh, bridges, okay, cost overruns. How you handle uncertainty? Cost overruns per uh, size, same curve. Uh, what else? Uh, execution and markets, same curve. What else? Uh, dams, same thing. Uh, project in the UK, 100 million do, uh, pound projects, okay, have 30% more cost overruns than 20 million pound projects. All right. So you can measure all these things and effectively see it, why a political unit that's small has an advantage, okay, aside from robustness, has, has even a financial advantage that's not taken into it, just simply from the way they handle uh, uncertainty. So, and here I have convexity effect in French and in English. So in English is don't cross a river that's on average four feet deep. Always bear in mind second order effects. In French is a convex function of an average, not the average of a convex function, all right? And the Jensen's inequality or variations around it that I work with, all right? So this is pretty much the, the response of the coffee cup. It has, it is uh, concave until it breaks, and then, you know, you can't break a coffee cup that's broken, all right? So it, doesn't, it don't care, as they say. So you have everything, it has nonlinearities that are local. Up to a point, you benefit from uncertainty in a, in a, in, in a convex part, and a concave one, you, you don't. This, another biblical, uh, uh, thing, uh, the Tower of Babel, all right, uh, which now is Baghdad, the suburbs of Baghdad, where they have ISIS, incidentally. All right, so they had the idea that when you build something very big, it's more fragile than a lot of small houses, okay? So we continue. Why fragility is necessarily second order effect to build some intuition? And I'm pulling this from the book because it seems to me that's what, what, what interests people the most, is that uh, uh, you, carry, you, wor you worry more of a second order effect than a first order effect when you're very fragile. Okay, by definition, what's concave? And here we have an example. If you have a grandmother and you know she spent 48 hours 
at 70 degrees temperature, you're very happy for her, no? But if someone tells you 70 degrees on average, but one day was zero degrees and the next day was 140 degrees, you're not gonna be very happy for your grandmother, okay? So you realize that the second order effect dominates the first order effect when you're fragile. And that's one thing that's not very present in uh, discourse, okay? Is that when you start fragility and there's a second order effect, and we can see immediately where it dominates the first order effect. Okay. So the, the, this is the S-curve in nature, okay, where you start at some level, you go up, and notice what, that everything in nature that has an S-curve, those response, has a phase in which it's convex and a phase where it's concave. And you can have it, you know, convex, concave, and then convex again, like uh, the, the, the one... Uh, at the bottom, for example, uh, going to a, a lecture at NYU is pleasant. Okay, it's great. You, you can you can invite a friend. It's a great thing. But two lectures, uh, all right, and 20 lectures. It's a negative. You see. So you have this is those response. Okay. But what is interesting is that <coughs> the convex part of the dose response means you want to have volatility right there. People don't quite get. For example, that you should vary within the, the, the place, you should have some randomness. Doctors aren't getting it because they can't, I'm just discovering from my fight over GMOs that they're not too much into, uh, into equations, all right? But then you can show it that anything in medicine that has nonlinear response, all right, should respond to uncertainty. And we have evidence from, I, 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 for antifragile, I, I found 200 papers showing evidence, but they're not glued together. For example, lung ventilators, Instead of giving, uh, right there, instead of giving someone 100% uh, 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 of the dose, you vary 80%, 120%, you have a convex response, <laughs> okay? You do better, and effectively people survive better. It's the same thing with your, uh, your heart. The way you can predict someone is gonna die is if their heart is, heartbeat is too regular. <laughs> So you, you and, and same thing with the, with the gym, same thing with feeding, all right? If you don't starve people, religions know that, of protein, they get cancer. So it's a second order effect that matters more than first order effect. When people study the Cretan diet in medicine, for example, they look at what people eat. No morons, you look at how frequently they eat, right? They only have meats on, on, on celebration days. And that was not just the Greek Orthodox Church, that was from uh, um, you read any book on, on ancient Greece, see how they ate. They ate meat on festivals, okay? But then they ate a lot of it. So, so they have definitely, there is definitely a convexity effect in that. And then days when you don't eat meat, you uh, cannibalize some of your bad uh, thing and you lower your cancer rate. It's in the literature, but they don't get the, the universality of the point of everything that's convex likes variability. So, uh, Okay, so I'll finish with, with, one, with one idea that, that uh, I mentioned Venice earlier. It's a system that lasted a thousand years, okay? City-states have lost uh, less a system forever. Collection of city-states under some kind of mafia dawn have survived much better than centralized uh, nation-state. Uh, these two failed twice, the first time in Upper Egypt, the second time in, the, in China, okay, when, and, and effectively people think that the growth of China came from the centralized state with a bunch of nerds, you know, around the emperor's palace. No, no, that's not how it worked. That's when it started to decline. <laughs> they got rich and then that's how they spent their money. And now uh, fourth time, third time would be America, probably uh, 2018 when large Washington would make the whole thing collapse. Well, I don't know, I'm kidding. I know I'm, anyway, so there's one interesting thing, property of time and fragility. You remember it said that fragile, what well, doesn't like uncertainty. The coffee cup doesn't like variability, doesn't like shocks. Um, effectively, so what has survived time is giving us indication as to its ability to handle disorder, you agree? So you take anything non-perishable, means has passed the hurdle, doesn't have a natural hurdle. You can easily take the perishable, but take something non-perishable. And, and you'll see an interesting property. Look at the graph, you can see a child and the grandfather, all right? Statistically, you can expect the great-grandfather. You can expect the child to outlive the great-grandfather, bearing some kind of uh, 
you know, outlier, you agree? All right, but now if there are technologies, a young technology or an old technology, who's likely to outlive the other? Sorry? Old. The old. It doesn't mean that the world is, doesn't have a lot of technologies. It means simply that new technologies don't survive. They're more likely to be supplanted by another new technology. Okay. So that's we call the Lindy effect, and I sort of modeled it within fragility, and it came out right. Okay, so I'm sort of happy with this. Um, that effectively you're getting conditional information on 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 fragility from time, and and okay, uh, something. There's a very simple rule. When you know every year uh, the old person lives, his life expectancy goes down, but a little under a year. You agree? Every year technology lives, its life expectancy goes up by more than one year. So if it's 100 years old, it has 100 years to go, at least, <laughs> statistically. Of course, someone's going to call me with some exception. We know there are exceptions. But, but the interesting thing is this is statistical, and, and, and it's quite liberating to see that the ones that really tend to stick are the ones are new technologies that replicate the old. Just a simple example, take the car. Nothing has been able to replace a car, right? You know, we tried, you know, it doesn't work. The plane, the tri how old is the car? 100 years? The plane, about the same, all right? The, the bicycle is older, now it's what's growing, okay? Uh, the computers, all right? People say, well, we have the internet, computers. Ah, comp let's talk about computers, all right? The rule is invariant to definition of fragility, you see? So as a car, we can define the car as something that has a box with wheels, in which case it's what, 5,000 years old? So Hyksos, okay? Or you define it as a red convertible, 51 years old, all right? So you see, so it's very interesting how you can define it. So now, let's talk about computers, all right? You've heard, you know, we had computers, all right? With something called mainframes. What replaced the mainframes? PC, what replaced the PC? Okay. This dying uh, thing called laptop. What's replacing laptops? Tablets, aha. Now, define a tablet as something you write on and you carry, all right? And you write with your hand on, and how old is that technology? <laughs> Five, okay, so, and it's very interesting that to see, in fact, if you look around, glass, you know, uh, this is plastic copy, you know, real thing. The, the, all these things are the chair, the chair actually is a, you know, people don't know, it's, a, it's very old, but it was reserved as a throne for, uh, for uh, the, the kings in the upper, the Egypt, Egyptian kings in the first dynasties, right? So you realize, uh, what else, the table, the, 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 have you heard of Nineveh, where they have Mosul, Mosul, Nineveh, that's where the fork was, dis uh, was discovered, okay? So you can imagine that a lot of the technology we use today are very old, and you can predict 3,000 years from now we'll use forks. We're not going to use some kind of uh, fancy contraption, and stuff like that. So this is interesting because you can judge political system that way. You can judge size. You can judge scale. You can figure out what has worked, okay? And effectively, city-states are very interesting to look in that, in, in that way, okay, in, in, in something that has survived. And there's something even more, I mean, and they come back, okay? You destroy and they come back. And effectively something, what, what I uh, figured out is the second order, of the second order effect. If I take two sample paths, uh, they both end up at ST, path one, path two. Path one went down straight line, path two, or it doesn't have to go down, path two went through horrible lows and bounced back. The second path, all right? Something that once through a second pass has given us information as to its fragility. It's telling us how much turmoil it can handle. You had to clean it up by something called survivorship bias. But, but uh, a coffee cup that survived the 3.0 on a Richter scale is telling us it can sustain at least 2.0, okay? So that kind of information we're getting from cities. So uh, I'm gonna add one thing for you to think, not part of cities, but sort of part of cities, which is we humans like dimensionality and modernity, along with Hausman and ugly, uh, big, anti, uh, what's his name, James Jacobs, Jacobs, the reverse of James Jacobs, all right? Except modernity likes to do things that are of low dimensionality, a lot of corners. But, but, but you look at this, is aesthetically pleasant, no? 
It's very high dimensionality, but it, it is disorder, no? It's much more pleasant to look at than a highway, you agree? Okay, but why is it that everything in nature is, is there's absolutely, ex except for if you're on a boat, the horizon is probably threatening. There's very little in nature that's ugly. <laughs> and I think that, look at this crap, all right? This is very ugly, all right? So, so there's something about geometry and dimension. And I noticed one thing uh, in Rome, is I was in a Vatican Museum where I took this uh, thing, and they have, there's not a single square inch without ornaments. And in a museum, even outside the museum, when it's for discovery pieces, it's not just that the good pieces made it to the museum. And if you go, and, and I thought that the pyramids were smooth, till I went, I went to verify, and went to the New York, uh, you know, the Met, where they stole that big pyramid, uh, you know, the, the big temple, temple of, uh, yeah, Dandur, that you, you go there, I thought it was smooth, get closer, it's only smooth because of time. <laughs> You see, we like high dimensionality, we like moldings, we like stuff. So while you walk around New York City, where the same thing mathematically can be mapped to your preferences, living in an environment that is uh, full, of, uh, full of people. High fractalness to the environment, and, other, and that is your preference, your anti-fragility, your preference for some class of disorder. So I'm going to conclude here. I spoke about the property called fragility. I tried to apply it to city-states, to the notion of city because it's a scale, it's smaller, and to the fact that we like some classes of disorder and maybe that's what we find in cities. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, we have some time left for Q&A. If you have questions, please come up to the mic. Do I stay here? Yeah, yeah, stay here. Yeah, stay there. Hi, Steve. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to thank you in 2008. I was working at the Federal Reserve in their research department, and I was very tortured about the decision to pursue my PhD or not. And it was when reading The Black Swan that I decided not to, which was really an excellent decision. So okay. <laughs> thank you for that. And my question is sort of on that topic of economics, which you know, you, it's not exactly the topic, but you alluded to problems with economics. I would argue it's a fragile discipline. And I've been spending a lot of time talking to groups and how it's thinking how to shift it. And I wonder if you think you just have to wait for this next crash maybe that's coming to really discredit it. Or if you think that, I mean, it's not going to come from the professors. They're too invested oh, in No, it. no. The, the, OK, so the economics, so in other words, to summarize is um, you don't want to discredit uh, scholars. I've discovered from when you read the history of scholarship, uh, scholarship has always had a tendency to like um, this parallel word. Uh, I, I called it in this book, uh, uh, teaching, uh, le uh, lecturing birds how to fly, all right? They invent the world. For example, uh, anti-fragile tinkering, bottom-up tinkering process, is behind growth in about anything. Okay, but it's masqueraded. You have a masquerade of like it's top-down science. So, but you have to look at the history a little more closely to realize that I call it the Soviet Harvard illusion again. That uh, you have a tendency by academia to to think that they invented ways for people. You know, uh, so when you look at definition of technology in a dictionary, what does it tell you? Technology means application of science to practical problems, no? In fact, if you, in fact, it's the exact opposite. Science tends to come from technology. <laughs> and what science didn't come from technology, like Euclidean geometry, this ugly thing, all right? It came later. We were building cathedrals without Euclidean geometry. And when we start applying it, we get this ugly uh, uh, squares, you know, that, that the ancients knew better not to have, OK? So, so the idea is. So not to teach economists to be wise, although we have some friends like uh, Bill Easterly who um, are, uh, of course, improving the field uh, greatly, but don't rely on them. They're, not, they're never going to get wise. Uh, so the idea is to build a system that can deal with mistakes made by economists. All right? Th that's one, one way. I mean, I personally say, OK, try to make some money by mis from, by, you know, from the mistakes they make, and that's fun. But you can't really. It's hard and a lot of work, and you have to argue with brokers and stuff. So it takes. But, but so eventually, we're going to have to live in a world 
that has some robustness built into it, and you have to separate us from errors made by professionals. A city states has the smaller the, 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 the distributed decision making, all right, allows us the, the, that, that uh, robustness, okay? So don't, but don't think that economists are gonna be smart overnight, okay? It's not gonna happen. <laughs> Question, yes. Question, Steve, one slide about time. So yeah. Basically, uh, to reiterate on that, it says that you, you, to in order to see in the future, you know, is to go back to the past. Ex uh, no, it tells you the following. This is very interesting. Yeah. Take the present as it is today, and I'm trying to predict the future 20 years from now. The, the most robust thing you could do is you take anything of the past 20 years and you remove it from the present. You see? You, take the, you project the present. You don't know what's going to happen, but you know what's not going to be there. Okay, and this works statistically very well. You see? And, uh, and adding to that with technology, um, you know, how does that factor into it? it I, I'm saying, I'm not trying to predict techno technology. I'm predicting what technology will not survive. Okay, you cannot predict, it's a, it would be fools to predict what's gonna happen. You know what to remove from the future, you see? So if the car had been 100 years, uh, you know, with us, don't expect it to go away in the next 20 years, all right? The bicycle, even less, is more robust than a car. You, you get the idea. So, and, but you can expect, uh, uh, that's how systems work. And even in architecture, this is modern architecture, I can, we can expect things to go back to natural things with a little more uh, dimensionality. Uh, now, yes? Yeah. Um, in your book, uh, Anti-Fragile, uh, you, you think positively in some way of uh, Jane Jacobs. Yes. In the sense that she, uh, helped preserve the West Village and uh, from uh, like neo-mania and modernism. Exactly, yes. Uh, but in like the result of that today was uh, in some sense the, 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 the neighborhood became frozen in time because it, 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 it got landmarked it, uh, and okay. it cannot transform anymore. So I mean, uh, uh, there's it? a difference between freezing something in time, yes. okay, or keeping something alive organically, you see? The problem is when you start to impose top-down solution, you end up with uh, avenues that are as ugly as this, you see. You end up with the Houseman style, big avenues. And Jane Jacobs, uh, probably she, be, it's good to be conservative, but nature is not conservative, okay? Nature is not, con nature destroys every day, but nature progresses by, by locally and by thinking. It doesn't progress by having uh, Alan Greenspan call up nature and say, we're not gonna have seasons anymore, all right? <laughs> to smooth out the cycle. It doesn't happen that way. It's, it's an organic thing. But, so you have to put things in a condition yes. to organically move. And if you look at pictures, actually buildings, you see how buildings vary through time. Yes, thank you. Uh, Hello? I, I can't see, yeah. Okay. In terms of uh, fragility, is it better to rent or own in the city? <laughs> <laughs> I have, okay, if you, uh, uh, <laughs> I have, I, have, uh, I have no idea. You're more convex if you own, you see. Uh, you're more convex, you have more upside if you own. All right, you have less downside, le less left tail. I would say they're equally fragile, all right? Anything to do with the city is, is, is not very smart, okay? <laughs> I mean, New York is too big. It's efficient, okay, but it's, New York is too big. Plus, there's too much of the wrong noise you get in New York. Plus, I mean, buying on something, when I see squares, I don't buy. You need cities built more, walk around Rome and try to find a wall that is smooth, that doesn't have, uh, uh, even low-income housing in Ostia, which is low-income ho housing by the Romans, okay, then had, uh, had ornaments, you see. So I wouldn't buy in a city that's like this. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, it seems like the second order effects that you're talking about are really important and very hard to I feel like it's a universal human thing that we just can't see it or something. You and detect it. Let me tell you, you detect it. And let me tell you what, one, one, uh, one error. I'm writing, actually I wrote a book after Antifragile called Silent Risk. And I'm splitting it in two books. One called The Mathematical Theory of Fragility, which is a short book. And the other, uh, a book on, on risk, okay? And, um, in that book, I have a chapter on why psychology, every time psychologists, all right, go against human nature, 
by saying these are biases made by humans, like, dread, like Ebola, all right? Psychologists were all saying that we're overreacting to Ebola, no? B why? Because psychologists focus on first order effect and your intuition incorporates second order effect. If you go with your first intuition, it has, so there's something called dread risk, which overestimate large deviation, but in fact, you need it to stay alive, you see? Which is why when, when people catalog, when I wrote The Black Swan, people say, oh, he's making people scared of these deviations. It's very healthy to be scared of these deviations. But it's very interesting that with Ebola, both your grandmother and a good complexity scientist would have seen the same thing, because one, the grandmother detects intuitively second order effect. You, the complexity scientist understands nonlinearity, but psychologists haven't yet gotten there. They need another 220 years, okay, to understand when they analyze uh, uh, human biases, whether the, their model okay, may not be very complete, okay? So it's the rational kind of analysis that doesn't, that... No, no, so-called rational analysis is not rational. It's just have the wrong models. In that chapter, I show you, for example, hyperbolic discounting, uh, why they, f they think it's irrational. In fact, it's very rational, all right? If you just make the model a little richer, or, or models uh, that, that have pre precisely second order effect not detected by, by, by a baby model, or things like saying, um, you, you, understand, you know that book nudge? Everything, I mean, largely what they say is uh, you should do the opposite, right? Nudge people to do the opposite, like, uh, because they, they think they have a model that you're rational not doing that, when in fact there is a meta reason if you have a much richer, more developed, fat tailed model, the things that fit the empirical reality a little more better, and the mathematical okay, reality, you know, is compatible with a good mathematical structure. For example, I took a bias of or people being stupid for, uh, uh, for uh, not investing in something called the equity premium bias. People were stupid. Papers came out in 2000 saying people were stupid to invest in bond, not stocks. And then you look at their model. It uses a, some kind of mean variance distribution, right? You use a different model. You think it's completely stupid to invest in stocks, right? You, you see the idea? So, but, and and the, the switch between these models comes through convexity. And that I explained in Silent Risk. So the book is called Silent Risk. It's available for free. Uh, Hi. Yeah, Hi. I don't see the, the because oh, of yeah. light. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. I think that your books sort of give, you know, as a student, all of us an important sense of skepticism about economic forecasting and central planning in general. But I guess I was wondering what you had to say about sort of all this stuff about big data and sort of a changing landscape towards uh, okay, better predictions in that sense. That's very interesting because you can fix convexity to big data in the following way. And actually, I did that full by randomness. Um, you have a covariance matrix, OK? All right? Now, now when, when the larger, you have two things going for you, all right, when you do, uh, you, number one is n, the number of observation per variable. You agree? And two is the number of variables you have, you see? OK, the failures of big data were known for a long time. And effectively, in 2007, we had um, half a billion correlations, OK? So, and, and, and when you have uh, correlation, odds are something's going to be spurious. You agree? OK, so now there's something very interesting. There's number of fake correlation you generate in a random matrix, OK, grows nonlinearly to the number of variables you're adding. You see, so the, the P, as you're adding the number of variables, making the, uh, for example, if I have a correlation matrix 100 by 100, it's almost impossible not to find 20 correlations that are significant. You see, you, you see the, and this is, uh, so as you're increasing your covariance matrix, the number of, uh, you know, the dimensionality, okay, then this increases nonlinearly. You see, if I double my correlation matrix, all right, how many correlation I get? N times N minus one divided by two, no? So you, you're really going up in a convex way, it goes up. It's sort of limited by the fact that there's something called, uh, some structure is limited, but it grows still very fast. Now, anybody who's took a, a class in statistics knows that your statistical significance grows at what rate? Root N, no? Okay, which is concave. So one is convex, one is concave, which tells you the following. The more variables you have, okay, for a given set of n, okay, we only we don't have a lot of n's. The more variables you have in finance, we have like 35,000 variables, all right, but we hardly have 20, 30 years of data, all right, maximum. 
I mean, some we have, but, but uh, okay. The larger the number of variables you have, the more you're going to observe noise. Who detected it? We detected it was fooled by randomness and started meeting with people. And then there's Ioannidis, who was part of that group uh, organized by a fellow who died, trying to find the bullshit in statistics. Okay, And he wrote a paper in 19, 2005 that's well known why most published results are wrong. Because as you have a lot of variables, epidemiologists are going to take the upper bound. You agree? So you're taking the upper bound of, of, of variables. So uh, with time, we have more and more data. You're going to have more and more spurious papers showing link between any kind of stuff epidemiologically. And the FDA in 2005, there was a lady from the FDA who told us that they banned any statistical information. They want clinical trials, all right? OK, so that was 2005. By then, 80% of papers that are statistical in medicine could not replicate. And the prediction we could make all at a time, the logical conclusion is with the speed of growth of data, that 10 years later, we'd be at 95%. And guess where we are? <laughs> right there. <laughs> you see? So pretty much because you have a growth of data, and you have researchers, and you have convexity. I mean, at the time, it was not framed in convexity. I framed it recently in terms of convex versus concave. So big data is going to eat us to the point. But you can use big data for one thing. If you decrease dimensionality, and the only people who seem to understand big data properly are the, 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 the NSA guys. Because you're only interested in, is, is he a terrorist? Yes, no. If you're only asking that question, you're not harmed. But if you throw the data out, someone's going to come in, try to make connection between the colors of the eyes of people in a certain town, OK, and the number of positive uh, uh, events in the stock market. That kind of, uh, that kind of, you see, if you're looking, if you're not pre-specifying the, the thing by reducing dimensionality. Uh, we have more time, no? Sorry? Ah, three minutes. OK, so go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about one um, city you probably find really ugly, Dubai. Now, if you, if you map it uh, over Dubai? Time, yeah. Oh, yeah, very ugly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you map it over time, do you, um, do you think certain cities have a stable property of fragility or anti-fragility? I don't know. I, I, I came late because of the, the travels, and I looked at um, a real estate in Paris when I was writing Anti-Fragile, and I was completely ignorant of these things. And, and, in fact, and I wondered, where was the expensive real estate? <laughs> And the expensive real estate turned out to be in neighborhoods that were villagey in looking, you see, and, and, then, and then where you effectively had some kind of uh, life, all right? And you can look at it in terms of dimensionality, namely the fifth, six in Paris, and, and, and uh, uh, the Marais, for example, and all these areas that were completely spared by modernity, you see? So it tells you that we were on a process before modernity of building neighborhood in a certain way. So I think that if you look at downtown Beirut, the areas, the old neighborhoods, and, and we're, we're not talking like Dubai, it was a bunch of tents. We're talking about a city that's uh, 5,000 years old, right? Continuously inhabited. Or take Damascus, 8,000 years old, continuously inhabited. So we have streets that have been around 8,000 years. Uh, Beirut has a few earthquakes, but it was rebuilt really along, you know, repatched up along what they had before. So if you look at these places, I would say that, that, that these cities are not doing something wrong, OK, because of that Lindy effect. So I would say I would uh, uh, commit uh, some kind of naturalistic fallacy by mixing my own aesthetics with, uh, with that Lindy rule, by saying what people have liked the longest is likely to make me happy for the longest. You see, you can be happy looking at this ugly. This ugly building over there might have been pretty attractive for someone for about two hours when it was built, right? But you, you want something more, you see, you see the idea. So preservationists understand that very well, but they don't have that framework. Uh, we have one more, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask, and this is maybe too soft of a question, but is there in our society, at least Western or American, a cultural bias against variability or a certain shame associated uh, with, I looked at your path one, path okay. two. Yeah, exactly. So what <laughs> happened is that the, there's a growth of allergy for variability that grows with uh, uh, statism, modernity, top-down control, you see? 
So anything that's top-down control has that allergy for modernity, for, for, uh, for variability. So you think you'd want to control everything, and you start compressing variation. That sort of happens with, with the state. To give you uh, an idea where the state, when I look at the area I'm from, to, to conclude here, uh, I come, and, and this is the reason I took this, but I am not yet an expert on cities, is because I made the following discovery. In, uh, in, 2000, uh, in, in, in about three years ago, Aleppo started getting into war, and I discovered this. Aleppo had been a city that was really richer than Western cities in Europe. And that part of the world, from Aleppo to northern Lebanon, to, to including Homs that owned the Beka Valley, uh, had produced uh, 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 four Roman emperors, stuff like that, but it was rich for about 5,000 years, right? And the system of city-states, and then of course you take Phoenician city, handled uh, uh, invaders very well, so they survived, you know, uh, usually making a, a deal with the local mafia don. And I was wondering why was it so rich, and when, when did the things fall apart? It fell apart when that state entered, and the metaphor is replaced the souk with its, all its mess with the office building. And if you see Egypt, for example, Egypt, if you see the prosperity, Egypt was lending to the UK, right? And Egypt was episodically, Alexandria was not part of Egypt, Alexandria is its own city. Uh, Beirut was not part of Lebanon, it, its own, it spoke its own language and didn't want to be part of Lebanon. Uh, so, but these cities were very prosperous, very mercantile, doing very well, but also they had something going for them, okay, that they were, it was, it was, there was no uh, status, of, there was no big state, and the state came to completely struggle, you know, to completely stifle these cities. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. Thank you.